Hello, Read 585. This is part two of two in our week eight lectures. Probably going to be one of my shorter weeks for lectures. I'm not commenting on any of the discussion because there was no discussion last week. Again, there's no discussion this week. In lieu of that, I would like you to do a survey monkey for your participation activity and also spend some time beginning your SWOT analysis. So uh, the objectives for the week are to use data to make instructional decisions, a little bit of the week seven readings, and then moving into being able to analyze your data using the SWOT analysis approach, which is from the week eight readings. So those are our goals. So first to review the article you read for last week titled, Making Instructional Decisions Based on Data, what, how, and why. And this article talks about three types of data. First, professional development data. Second, classroom data. And third being student data. All of these being more formative types of data, not necessarily your summative data like your CST would be. So what I like about this article is not only do they give you a framework for doing uh, data analysis, but they give you these great guiding questions, which you can definitely use and apply when you're analyzing your data for the SWOT analysis. So within the area of professional development data, thinking about what patterns do you observe in the data and how do you explain the patterns you see in the data, I actually am working on bringing a consultant from the University of Michigan to do some coaching and development of my K2 teachers at my school and uh, she sent me some guiding questions to reflect on and answer to help her plan her support to the teachers and one of the first questions she asked was what professional development have we already provided what book studies have we done what type of ongoing support do teachers have and I actually never really thought until then and until reading these this article um, the importance of looking at that historical data almost of the learning experiences of the staff and that may explain some of the deficits in knowledge and skill sets when you look at the development that has been provided and what it's been focused on and what you're lacking. So very interesting to take a look at professional development data. Next is classroom data. And typically, when you think of classroom data, you think of student performance, which this incorporates as well. But this is more of observational data of teacher effectiveness and instructional quality in the classroom. So what are some of the strengths of instruction? What areas show a need for improvement? What content and strategies are emphasized in the instruction? which are not emphasized, how do you explain the patterns you see in the data? So at first glance, when you think classroom data, you think of student performance data, which essentially how effective the teacher is can be measured by student learning outcomes, but this is really looking at the quality of instruction, which is very important. Next, we have student data which looks at patterns in the student data at the school level, grade level, and classroom level. Where is the growth? Is it equal across all grades? I know right now I'm seeing my second grade team not make as much growth as my first and kinder team. So I'm actually spending three days and assessing all of their kids and doing a diagnostic prescriptive approach and trying to help them because they have not been doing as much formative assessment as my other two grade levels and I'm noticing a difference in their performance. Um, also, what are strengths? What are areas for improvement? What patterns do you see? And then lastly, in putting it all together, Thinking about all three of these areas, what connections can you make across professional development data, classroom data, student data, what are the strengths and the needs? And there were more uh, questions in this section. I didn't um, type those all out for you, but great guiding questions to think about. They also give you a framework for data analysis. 
They encourage you to first organize the data set so that members of the teams can partner up and analyze different portions of the data set. They mention that partnering allows for more than one set of eyes on the same data and provokes substantial discussion. Second, they suggest that you select a recorder for the team. The recorder will take notes on the team's discussion of the observations during step four. Third, you're going to partner up and analyze that data. Each person jots down their observations on his or her own worksheet, the worksheet consisting of the questions that I just showed you. Fourth, after sufficient time for partners to look at the data, the team is going to put it all together in a discussion of their findings, patterns in the data, and interpretations. And then ultimately, they are going to devise professional development, which is what you're going to be doing as an outcome of your SWOT analysis. And then fifth, teams plan when and how they will communicate the formative plan to school personnel and stakeholders. And then big important piece is monitoring the implementation of their plan. So often teams or administrators or literacy specialists or even teachers in the classroom make these great plans for how they're going to improve instruction or improve the school, but they don't monitor these plans and as a result, um, you know, the ball gets dropped somewhere along the line or, you know, growth kind of stagnates somewhere. All right, the second article we're talking about is making the most of assessments to inform instruction. This is very much based on classroom-based assessments, and it almost gives you a few recommendations for your assessments. The first recommendation is that you should assess more than a single skill. As we know, the process of reading is truly a process. It's holistic. It requires a variety of skills. So it shouldn't just be focused on a narrow set of skills or one skill in isolation, but should assess and encompass a wide range of skills. Second, they encourage you to use formative assessments that are in aligned with actual instruction. So making sure to have these formative assessments along the way that are meaningful instead of just summative assessments. Next, they urge you to design multimodal assessments. Consider the format of the assessment. Do you always have to do paper and pencil? Can you bring in some multimedia? Can you do some digital storytelling? And that's a big shift with the Smarter Balanced and the Perk assessments are these performance tests that encompass a variety of skills, reading, close reading, uh, listening and speaking with some form of discussion, brainstorming, writing, many different skills. And then lastly, developing that teacher expertise, which has been a common thread in a lot of our articles we've been reading for this course. Thinking about how have you developed your teachers to be successful with classroom-based assessment, giving them the time and the skill to do these things. All right, that's really all I have to say on the past readings. Again, you have two readings for this week, and their purpose is to familiarize with the SWOT analysis and give you some examples of that. Those were our session objectives. Hopefully, you have now a framework for making instructional decisions and analyzing the data and some great guiding questions to use in looking at the data and are better prepared to start analyzing your data for the SWOT analysis. Definitely see the articles for ideas for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. All right, to launch you, if you recall from Read 516, I am quite obsessed with Kid President, and he actually has a new video that was developed just three um, months ago, and it is titled um, 20 Things We Should Say More Often, and I would like to show you that as our launch. 20 Things We Should Say More Often. Number 20, thank you. And not just on Thanksgiving, every day. Number 19, excuse me. Number 18, here's a surprise corn dog that I bought you because you're my friend. There'll be more corn dogs, more happy people. This is a good idea. 
Corn dog for you, corn dog for you, corn dog for you. Number 17, I'm sorry. Number 16, I forgive you. Number 15, you can do it. But don't say it if it's something they can't do. Number 14, another thing that we should say more often. I have barbecue sauce in my shirt too. Before you say something about the barbecue sauce on somebody else's shirt, take a look at the barbecue sauce on your own shirt. Number 13, please. Number 12, everything is going to be okay. Number 11, oh, you got me a corn dog too? You shouldn't have, buddy. Number 10, I don't know. I know a lot of people who need to say that. My sister. <laughs> None. You're so awesome, I named my dog after you. Wait, wait, wait. That could hurt someone's feelings. I mean, boat. I named my boat after you. Wait, who even had the boat? You're so awesome, I legally changed my name to yours. Wait, that's super creepy. Just tell people they're awesome and mean it. Number eight. Hello, person I never met before. Here's a high five. Number seven. My sports team is not always the best sports team. It takes a big man to say that. Number six. Nothing. Sometimes that's the best thing you can say. Number five. <laughs> Doesn't mean anything, but it's just really funny. <laughs> Number four. I disagree with you, but I still like you as a person. Who is a human being, and I'll treat you like that. Because if I didn't, it would make everything bad, and that's what lots of people do in this lane. Whew, I need a water break, y'all. It's okay to disagree, but it's not okay to be mean. Number three, sometimes you just gotta scream. <laughs> Number two, life is tough, but so are you. Sometimes we all need to be reminded to keep going. Number one, something nice, anything. If you can't think of anything nice to say, you're not thinking hard enough. So what about you? What do you think people should say more often? Leave a comment below and let's hear it. Oh, and I got a bonus one for you. Something that we should say more often? Let's dance. All right, and on that note, I ho hope you have a great week. If you haven't seen Kid President's pep talk, that one's pretty inspirational and motivational as well. And hopefully you reflected on maybe something you could say more often going into the next week. It's okay to say I don't know, but make sure you are being encouraging and affirming and telling people they're awesome. All right, have a great week, everyone. Let me know if you need anything.